What's up everybody D-Man back welcome to a brand new video and today we're going to be doing another Godzilla x Kong: the new empire news roundup that's right in this one we will be continuing our chronological journey through the development of the monsterverse by talking about events that happened in March 2023. <laughs> There's so much freaking drama in this video. <laughs> I'm interested to see how people are gonna feel about this one, so let's jump into it. Starting out the Asylum, Earth's greatest movie company is releasing Ape vs. Mecha Ape because obviously they didn't know that Godzilla vs. Kong was gonna try and one-up them by doing basically the same premise of having a big ape and a big monster fight and then throwing a robot in there just to steal the magic away from Ape vs. Monster, Earth's greatest movie. That was so rude of Godzilla vs. Kong to do, but you know what? It's better this way because Ape vs. Monster took its time. Ape vs. Mecha Ape is its own dedicated standalone movie to that premise where it doesn't have to have a giant monster distracting from the premise of an ape fighting a giant mech. You can just get to the juice that people want. Ape vs. Mecha Ape released its poster and it looks incredible. Mecha Ape's awesome. Obviously kind of like a Mechanicong but for the modern age which is what we've all been needing. Ape vs. Mecha Ape then released its DVD poster and then Ape vs. Mecha Ape released its trailer and I gotta be honest. Mecha Ape seems like a lot to handle and I have not watched the movie it came out a while ago i haven't watched it yet because i just can't stand to see abraham in any more pain after the pain he was put through when he had to fight monsters it's just not fair i don't want to see abraham in any more pain he saved washington dc which is something we all hope will happen if a monster comes for it in real life as well he's a hero an american hero and a patriot and i will not stand for it haya has a godzilla 2019 re-release but it's actually an updated version it's not a straight up re-release it's an updated version taking in some criticism people had about the original release this stands at seven inches and is an articulated figure. It is redesigned in the neck and mouth area and runs you $49.99, which was the same price as the original. This wasn't a replacement for the original. It didn't like undo the original. They just heard that people had some complaints and so when they re-released the figure, they made adjustments for it. They then announced their Haya Heat Ray Godzilla 2021 using, I think the same sculpt here, just with a different paint job. I don't know how they differentiate between 2019 and 2021. I think this could be the secret reason they wanted to do this re-release because this feature an upgraded neck and head and again will run you $50 if you can get it without shipping that is. I have some promo images from Spiral Studios Mothra 2019. This is a magnificent model. Spiral Studios is such a high quality brand. These things are incredible. It's blacklight accessible so if you blacklight it it'll have this cool color scheme to it kind of representing Mothra's bioluminescence in the movie. I love the creative way they've gotten Mothra to fly as well with the flame. This thing runs you $1,999 and can be paid with installments over time. Spiral Studios Ultimate Masterline Mothra 2019 Amago Mystical Version was revealed through this poster. What a beautiful poster with beautiful art of such a beautiful Mothra. I love me the King of the Monsters Mothra. I just think it's so fantastic. The Spiral Studios Mothra 2019 Mystical Version is actually pretty much the same as the original. It looks very similar. It's also blacklight accessible. I struggled to find the difference here. This one runs $2,049 and the only difference I can really tell is that this one has LED capabilities glowing the flames and also making Mothra glow blue and that looks very beautiful. Getting into some juicy behind the scenes drama on some stuff we have all been wondering about for a long time we're going to talk about Akira Takarada's cut cameo from Godzilla 2014. Of course Takarada was the actor who played Ogata in the original Godzilla from 1954 and then starred in many Godzilla films over the years since then. Takarada was supposed to have a return to the Godzilla franchise in 2014 but he was cut from the movie for some reason. This is a really tricky complicated situation for me to discuss. I know I think quite a bit about it. I've been able to piece together quite a bit because I know a lot of these key players and so I've learned a lot but the last time I led like a campaign hashtag release the Takarada cut which is something I was tweeting like once a day every day until hopefully it got some traction and it did start to get traction some people reached out to me and were basically like hey man if you ever want to be involved in anything more than just your silly little YouTube channel you'll knock that off and so I kind of had to but KDM revealed some interesting details stating that he interviewed Akira Takarada, Tetsuya Takarada, and Tim 
Jim Bean, Takarada's manager and personal friend, and that interview is supposed to come out sometime this year in 2024, with the full truth behind the cameo, BTS drama, Gareth Edwards' emails to Takarada, and then to prove that he meant business, KDM released this photo of Akira Takarada. This was taken on set in Vancouver on March 18th, 2013, over 10 years ago at this point, and it was on the first day of shooting Godzilla 2014 in Vancouver at the Vancouver Convention Center. Takarada played a customs agent inspecting an open passport, and then he stamps the passport, welcoming Ford to Japan, stating, Thank you, Mr. Brody. Welcome to Japan. We'll wait to see what KDM's full scoop finally reveals when he's finally able to release this thing. It's probably to celebrate 10 years of Godzilla 2014 and restir some of this to hopefully get that cameo released. I don't think we will ever see it. As I understand it, and I could be wrong, as I said, I'm kind of putting together puzzle pieces here, so maybe they don't fit together perfectly. Akira Takarada's cameo was basically brought about because Tim Bean was a Godzilla super fan and led a very successful campaign to get Takarada his cameo, following Takarada verbally stating that it's his dreams and desires to have a cameo in the 2014 movie at G-Fest. It worked, Gareth Edwards saw, and so eventually they got Takarada his cameo. But basically, it kind of sounds like Thomas Toll, producer Thomas Toll, stepped in and wanted the scene cut for runtime reasons. Takarada got upset about it, and so there was some headbutting. Some other people tried to get involved to try and cool things and get the cameo put back in the movie. And essentially, it kind of sounds like Thomas Toll kind of got in a pissing match with Takarada, cutting him out of the movie because he's kind of an asshole. And so, goodbye Takarada. We're never really going to see that scene, I don't think, because as I understand it, if they do release it, they'll have to pay a Toho salary to Takarada because he was a Toho actor, and so there was some contractual thing there where he had to be paid a little bit more. It's a similar reason to why we're probably never going to see a lot of that cut footage from Godzilla vs. Kong starring like Zi Yi Yang and a lot of those characters, is because once they release footage of a character who has been cut entirely out of a movie, they have to pay that person a bonus wage for the work they did, and it sounds like they don't want to do that. We're probably never going to see that Takarada scene, and it kind of sounds like that scene has been locked behind a blast door where it's going to be really hard to get at. I found some Godzilla King of the Monsters interviews I'd never seen before, so I wanted to discuss those. These were reshared by people like Toho Kingdom around this time, and in the first one with Ken Watanabe from Godzilla King of the Monsters, he states that he was impressed to see the size and scale of Godzilla, and I'm not sure if he was talking about the movie or the Cinerama Dome, which he's standing in front of, but he says, I want to buy it. I don't really know what it is. Is it the movie or is it the Godzilla head? He says he might not because he's turning into a bit of a Godzilla side person, and so he's decided to take a break from Godzilla for a while following this movie. He says he was excited for the 2014 film to release, but there was a lot of skepticism, especially from fans, on if it would turn out alright. But for King of the Monsters, it feels a bit more like an anticipated movie, and it feels like it'll meet people's expectations because it's a classic Godzilla vs. King Ghidorah styled movie. There's another interview starring the director of Godzilla King of the Monsters, Michael Doherty, and also Ken Watanabe. This is another Japanese interview. In it, it starts out with this goofy Ghidorah impression from Watanabe, where Watanabe says that Ghidorah is his favorite, but as a kid, he really loved the superheroes. Doherty then says his favorite is Rodan because he's such an underdog. Watanabe says it was exciting to play the part of Serizawa because he's a leader, even though he's a scientist. Doherty then says he would love to make kaiju real in the real world because in the movie, they represent the strength of Mother Nature, and how in the film, it's supposed to represent that when mankind does bad things to the planet, nature strikes back. He says that the whole message of the movie is that we must learn to coexist with nature, otherwise Mother Nature will unleash her wrath. Doherty confirms that in the past of the MonsterVerse, there was a society that lived in harmony with the Titans, and at some point that harmony was severed, and that history eventually became fairy tales and myths and stories, and everybody forgot what the truth was. Everybody except Godzilla. In a post-Godzilla vs. Kong world, it seems like Adam Wingard has kind of thrown a lot of those ideas out the door, but maybe they'll be kind of brought back up into new ways in Godzilla x Kong the New Empire, given the new Hollow Earth Kingdom and all that stuff. Although Godzilla is a bit more of an asshole now than he ever was before, and so I don't think that those ideas have remained intact. I guess that's kind of the problem when you have shifting creatives all of the time and nobody's on the same page. Watanabe then speaks to the real-world parallels between Godzilla and natural disasters, and then says that the power of the MonsterVerse is taking these messages and stories and turning them from Japan's Godzilla to the world's Godzilla, and making the franchise more global in both its scale, scope, and reach, and also its thematic value. Doherty then says he views Godzilla as a peace ambassador, bringing Japan to the United States so soon after the war, and then eventually turning the franchise into a shared brand between the US and Japan, in a way sort of closing that gap. It's a really cool way to look at it. Watanabe then says that while Godzilla 2014 was good, this new movie King of the Monsters takes things to the next level and gives Godzilla some purpose again, elevating him. 
There's another interview with Kyle Chandler and Vera Farmiga that I found interesting. In it, they said that it's day to day on whether it's harder to do personal scenes or act against fantastical monsters. It all depends on the context of the moment and how they're feeling that day. Chandler then says the hardest part is getting there, not doing it. It's hard to get to the point where you allow yourself to pretend to act against monsters and then once you're doing it, it kind of comes naturally. They acted against laser lights and the cries of the monsters. They also had music playing on set to help them get into the emotion of the scene, which is really cool. The elemental effects like fire, rain, explosions were often real, so it was very easy for them to react to. Chandler then says that O'Shea Jackson Jr. would do the best in a world filled with monsters, and he would most likely befriend them. Kyle Chandler then says anything could happen when talking about how O'Shea Jackson Jr. deserves a Godzilla cartoon. I found that one interesting and wanted to bring it up because, of course, O'Shea Jackson Jr., Barnes from Godzilla King of the Monsters, is campaigning to get his very own Monsterverse animated series, G-Team. So, that's kind of cool. We have a couple interviews from KDM. The first one is with Drew Edward Johnson of the Godzilla comics. He's the artist. He said that as far as he's aware, Muto Prime killed the most powerful member of Godzilla's species to lay her eggs in back in the day, but that even that Godzilla was no match to the modern Godzilla, who's the king of the monsters. He also wasn't informed that the Orca, which is featured in Godzilla Aftershock, would then go on to be seen in Godzilla King of the Monsters. So he says that was a pretty cool surprise. Greg Keyes, the writer of the King of the Monsters and Godzilla vs. Kong novelization, and in my opinion, one of the few men holding the glue together that is the world building of the monsterverse was always kept up to date with the story changes on Godzilla vs. Kong and so the novelization is written off a near final version of the script although not the final version which is why it doesn't really follow a lot of the lost storylines such as the Orca Z. In a second interview with Keyes and KDM he says he's under the impression that the novelizations are canon because they need approval from Toho and Legendary and because he has to consult with the mythology department and the directors and writers of the films in order to get them approved. We have new details about Godzilla Godzilla vs. Kong's motion capture process. This comes from KDM, where he states that mocap was used for Godzilla vs. Kong here and there, for Kong especially, and a tad for Godzilla and the other creatures. Alan Henry was the Weta mocap performer, and Dave Clayton, the animation supervisor, filled in for the rest. Now I have some tea that I won't say where it comes from, but it does come from, let's just say, some people in the industry. That one of the reasons you don't see our Godzilla King of the Monsters mocap superstars and performers returning is because it's a lot cheaper for studios to just send in their animation supervisor to go run around to the mocap studio than it is to hire actors to play characters. Basically, the difference is, on one end, you're just getting a guy to do a job that's already basically his job, and he can do it quickly and do as little as possible so that it requires as little pay as possible so that the VFX studios can underbid other companies. Whereas on the other hand, you have to hire actors who, you know, get into character and live the characters and do some fun stuff with the characters and provide some of the most fun we have in the MonsterVerse. So as a cost-cutting measure, sometimes they don't do that. That. And that never sits right with me personally. KDM talks about the Warbat name change, stating that originally Adam Wingard named the creatures Nozuki, and that these were changed to Warbat without his approval. I've got a little bit of tea that I've discussed many times on the channel, but basically it all came down to Playmates testing the name Nozuki, deciding it didn't work, and then eventually landing on Warbat, which they thought did sell the toys to kids. KDM then teases Adam Wingard's dark secret truth. It's actually a lot less about Wingard and a lot more about Gareth Edwards, which I found interesting. KDM discussed how directors are essentially just actors, and everything needs approval from executives on what they can talk about. This includes interviews, which in many cases are scripted. Many times interviewers are allowed to submit questions, and then their questions are picked for approval, in which the people behind the scenes can come up with pre-done answers so that you're not throwing the interviewee off. That's not always the case, but it can be the case. KDM revealed that Wingard's original cut of Godzilla vs. Kong was 2 hours and 15 minutes, which was eventually cut down to the 2 hour runtime for the studio, and the work print was about 2 hours hours 45, but that was never really the intended runtime. Wingard never wanted that, and it was eventually cut down because, hey, work prints always are cut down, and they always start too long. It's easier to cut than it is to add. KDM then revealed that Wingard was very happy with the final cut of Godzilla vs. Kong, unlike Gareth Edwards, I didn't know that, who apparently really fought for his vision, but it really was never realized, including the Takarata scene, which he wanted in the movie very badly, but there was so much behind-the-scenes drama that it's no wonder that he walked away from the franchise. I mean, I kind of knew that he had a negative experience. I just thought it was because of the stress he was under, but now maybe that's the source of the stress. I know something similar happened to one of the other MonsterVerse directors, I'm sure you can figure out who, who was under a lot of studio pressure and stress, and maybe some of the things they wanted didn't get fully realized the way they hoped, and so maybe that's one of the reasons that they're not back in a more official capacity. KDM shot down some fake leaks for Godzilla X Kong the No Empire. One of my favorites was the one about Gigan being like a monarch vehicle, space Godzilla, and then super Godzilla, and people actually believe 
believe this stuff. He also shut down the one about the fake Kong clone army, which I thought was a lot of fun. And in the same swing, he debunked Minus One's fake leaks about Godzilla Zero, even though I did see some tweets where it seemed like he himself believed some of those Godzilla Zero rumors. But, you know, we all make mistakes sometimes. I've fallen for fake stuff many, many times. But I'm glad that he cleared the air on it. Godzilla X Kong The New Empire's music score mixer is Alan Mearson. That's cool, I suppose. KDM then weighed in on Legendary's Godzilla contract, confirming that the contract never ended in 2020 and was never going to end with Godzilla vs. Kong. He confirmed that Toho is invested in the MonsterVerse and co-produces the MonsterVerse films, and so they have no desire to stop. Thomas Toll announced the trilogy back in 2014 because that's all they could foresee at the time, but it wasn't because that's all they were allowed to do. The fact that Yoshimitsu Bano's name is returning on the new film is proof that the old contract is still in play, as if it was renewed, it probably wouldn't be there anymore. Just to clarify, Legendary Pictures can license any Toho kaiju they want at any time, they just simply have to pay for them. KDM then teases once again that Monarch Legacy of Monsters will have some connections to Godzilla X Kong the New Empire, although he states they're not as you maybe think. I have no idea what that means. I'm really gonna guess it has to do with the relationship between Monarch and Apex, that's gonna be my guess, or maybe some reference to one of the hidden realms like Axis Mundi. KDM then released this list of all the main Godzilla X Kong the New Empire shooting locations, at least for the sound stages. A lot of this stuff is in Australia or Hawaii. And then you got some stuff which was Rio, which was actually shot in Australia or other places like that, where you've got places that are filling in for other places, essentially, which we all knew already. Big news was revealed here as Godzilla X Kong was revealed to be shot in IMAX with IMAX MSM 70mm film with panavised Canon 1200 lenses. Other cameras used on the shoot were the Alexa 65 with Prime, aka fixed focal length lenses, meaning you can't zoom in, but you can choose your focus easier. DNA lenses. This is the first MonsterVerse film shot in D1570 format and is the first MonsterVerse film shot for IMAX, not optimized for IMAX. This is actually shot for IMAX, which means you can see more of the monsters more of the time with a bigger aspect ratio. There's behind the scenes photos of the camera team in Rio, which was shot in Gold Coast, Queensland. That's fantastic. I love the bigger aspect ratio. It just makes them feel more massive and grand like Pacific Rim or the first Jurassic Park. To bring things way down on an unfortunate note, Lance Reddick, who was the monarch leader in Godzilla vs. Kong, although his role was significantly cut to just a cameo for the final movie, did pass away at the age of 60. I have discussed that in previous videos that I released last year, but I wanted to bring that back up again. He was a phenomenal actor, and it's just a shame that he went so soon. All right, that'll do it for this one, guys. What was your favorite bit of behind-the-scenes tea that we spilled? I hope I didn't stir too much up and get too much flack on my back for covering this stuff. Comment that down below and let me know. As always, I want to give a huge thank you to my patrons over on Patreon. If you want to support the Patreon, you can use the link in the description below where you can get early access to content, access to the Discord community, and more. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed. I will see you guys next time for the next one. D-Man, out. I'll drop this clip at the end of the video, but this is the first thing I'm recording. I can't even explain how literally physically drained I feel right now. And a fun part of that is uh, I saw a new clip from the Chinese trailer for GXK, which I will not be covering. Just is too much. I'm not going to watch it either. But without spoiling anything, it's a clip of the 2019 Godzilla doing a big sprint and jump. No joke, I feel like half the time I see a new clip from this movie, it literally drains my life force. Hope it's a good one. <laughs>